Imagine you're setting up a scene for a film shoot, moving props so that the shot is just so. One hanging, dangling prop body breaks in your arms, but rather than seeing screws and plastic bits, you see, well, the inside of an arm. Actual bone and mummified sinew. What would you do? Well, this is exactly what happened to the film crew in 1976 while shooting a $6 million man episode in the Pike Amusement Park in Long Beach, California. While this was quite a creepy shock for the crew, I'm sure, it's nothing compared to what this body had gone through during its longer-than-death life. After their discovery hanging at the amusement park, the mummified remains were positively identified. Elmer J. McCurdy. Elmer, who has a few different listed names, was born in Washington, Maine on January 1st, 1880. So how his body ended up clear across the country nearly 100 years later is quite remarkable, and anything but resting in peace. Elmer had many jobs during his short life, training as a plumber early on and moving from state to state with this trade. He was unable to hold a job for long and eventually joined the military in Oklahoma, where he was introduced to nitroglycerin and its explosive properties. He would use this incredibly limited knowledge in his next notoriously short career, heists. Well, more like poorly planned and executed bank and train robberies. For his first heist, McCurdy intended to rob a train he thought to have a few thousand dollars on board. After setting nitroglycerin charges on the safe door, it exploded, along with most of the contents that weren't scattered about. A 1911 newspaper estimates the robbers netted around $100, if that. Some reports also say that they were able to secure some silver as well. Well, whatever they accidentally melted and was now fused to the safe. <laughs> Train crew also managed to see the robbers' faces if the bungled robbery weren't enough. The second heist, later that same year, ended similarly. After spending hours deconstructing a bank wall with hammers, McCurdy set his nitro charges on the vault. The room was destroyed, but the safe was, well, safe. Another nitro charge on the safe failed to go off, leaving the crew to take only some coins that were outside of the safe. Mere weeks later, McCurdy, just 31, planned to rob a train containing $400,000 to go to the Osage Nation. Look, I never said he was a great guy. He, uh, got the wrong train and ended up with less than $50, a watch, gun, coat, and two bottles of whiskey, and a $2,000 bounty reward for his capture. He went into hiding, drank his whiskey, and was discovered by three law enforcers with whom he had a shootout for a relatively long time, considering he was just one guy and had been drinking. Anyway, eventually McCurdy was fatally shot, and his body sent to nearby Pahaska, Oklahoma. But though McCurdy's living legacy was over, his story had only just begun. Elmer McCurdy's body was unclaimed by family, so the undertaker, Joseph L. Johnson, used arsenic, a then common way to preserve the body, in case next of kin eventually came calling. No one did, and wanting to be compensated for his professional embalming services, Johnson put McCurdy's body on display in the back of the parlor. He did a really good job after all, and charged admission. A nickel to see the bandit who wouldn't give up. It's said that viewers would deposit the nickels inside the corpse's mouth for Johnson to collect later. The undertaker got many offers to buy Elmer's body, but the steady income the display provided was too good to lose. Eventually, two men claiming to be Elmer's family did show up to claim the body. They did all the footwork to substantiate their claim, too, first calling the county sheriff and a local attorney, and arranging the body to be put on a train to California to comfort their worried mother. Oh. But of course, it turns out they were actually stealing oddities and curiosities for their traveling circus. The Patterson brothers had had their sights on Elmer's body for quite some time prior. Elmer began touring all over under names like The Embalmed Bandit and The Outlaw Who Would Never Be Captured Alive. Eventually, this show was sold to another circus company and Elmer's remains went with it. As the years passed, Elmer's body was bought and sold from one show to the next, always on the move. I have to wonder if the fact that this was a real corpse got lost along the way. Were buyers aware they were purchasing actual human remains? Elmer ended up in a criminal wax museum of all places next to wax figures of Jesse James and other infamous outlaws, but he was the real deal. Elmer was a sideshow for other events as well. After so many years, Elmer McCurdy's body ended up mummifying, the skin becoming taut and therefore shrinking the body size, which now only weighed a fraction of what it did. In this state, the body was used as an exhibit for a 1933 movie, Narcotic, about the risks and dangers of drugs. 
Elmer, though he allegedly had a drinking problem while he was living, was propped up in the theater lobby as a dope fiend and cautionary visual about what drugs could do. Utterly false, of course, but the director, unconcerned with the facts, claimed that the corpse's state was proof positive of drug abuse. His longest rest in peace up to this point seems to be the time he was stored in a warehouse from 1949 to 1964. Poor guy. But Elmer's film and TV career were not over yet. He appeared in the 1967 horror film She Freak, credited Elmer McCurdy as movie prop. He was then passed from hand to hand, being sold to the Hollywood Wax Museum, along with actual wax figures. Again, did they know he wasn't wax? Around this time, Elmer's body was loaned to a company who displayed him at Mount Rushmore. By now, Elmer was in rough shape. The years of exposure had taken their toll, and to make matters worse, a windstorm during this Mount Rushmore exhibition tore off pieces of the corpse's face. The tips of the ears and nose were gone. The fingers and toes fell off too. The prop was now considered too gruesome and not lifelike enough, which is super ironic, to use, and Elmer was sold to the owner of the Pike Amusement Park in Long Beach, California. You might think that if anyone knew these were actual human remains, they would show some respect. But given how explorers treated other cultures' burial remains, I don't have high hopes. Covered in layers of phosphorescent paint and hanging high from fake gallows in the rafters of an amusement park laugh-in-the-dark attraction, though, it's a low all of its own. The 1976 finding of the corpse on set at Pike Amusement Park caused quite the stir. Law enforcement were called in and experts were able to positively identify the remains as Elmer McCurdy. Radiographs, gas tests, and others combined with trinkets in the corpse's mouth, such as a penny from 1924, and ticket stubs to a few sideshow exhibits, provided key context. Once Elmer was identified, his story was everywhere, and his remains were back in demand. There were so many calls from funeral directors to bury him, free of charge. So different from the original in Balmer Johnson, and yet so similar. Hmm. Eventually, it was determined that he should be sent to Guthrie, Oklahoma, his casket encased in two feet of concrete to ensure that he is troubled by the living no more and will hopefully rest in peace. Eternal rest and peace, however, are not in the cards for Elmer quite yet, it seems. In 1986, Becky Lurker bought Guthrie, Oklahoma's historic Houghton Mansion turned Smith Funeral Home, restored it, and reopened it as a bed and breakfast, the Stone Lion Inn. The old corners table is still used as a focal point, and it's displayed right in the foyer for drinks and such. Imagine having a cocktail on a corpse block. Super macabre. In a rather inspired marketing move, the inn hosts Murder Mystery Weekends. Guests check in and spend their weekend in character solving a crime and potentially being visited by non-living guests. The event is incredibly popular and controversial. Apparently in the event's earlier days, the weekend would kick off at Elmer's grave, which is nearby. The participants would dress in black, drive in procession with headlights on to the Boot Hill section of the cemetery, and invoke his name to start things off in supernatural style. Poor Elmer's being called to go to work after all his touring? <laughs> I just can't even catch a break in death. Anyway, in the midst of the satanic panic of the 1980s and 90s, the residents of Guthrie complained about the procession, prayers, and satanic rituals Lurker staged and called for changing the cemetery hours and only allowing activities relating to internment. This angered the Girl Scouts, who would play hide-and-seek behind the tombstones. Though Lurker's event was slightly altered, there would be no more staging prop murder victims in the cemetery itself, participants still visit Elmer's grave at the start of the Supernatural weekend. And if you stay at the Stone Lion Inn, you might just catch a glimpse of more than Elmer McCurdy to this very day. Elmer, though his life was relatively short, lived on for many years touring, and even today his legacy survives. He goes beyond the phrase, working to death, into working after death. But what are some of your thoughts? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you, friends and fiends, for taking this rather macabre tour with me. Do subscribe so you won't miss the next creepy and curious video. Goodbye!